Hi, this is Mike Maloney, and it's been quite a while since I've done an update on the death of the global dollar standard. I've been uh, keeping people updated on this since 2009. I used to do live presentations on it and so on. And the nails in the coffin are coming faster and faster, and I just wanted to point out a couple that have happened this year. Uh, back in February, uh, Romania has is considering bringing back its international gold reserves. So uh, that's they've got gold that's held at the Bank of England and such, and they're going to be repatriating that possibly. Uh, central bank gold buying hit its highest level in half a century, uh, and there's quite a few articles on that, but this one from SRS Rocco, he's got some charts of it, and it shows how much gold uh, that the central banks are buying. And if you could go back a little bit further here, you would see that this would go negative. Uh, central banks on the whole, net purchases of central banks, they were sellers back before the crisis of 2008. The central banks sold a bunch of their gold, like for instance, the Bank of England, right at the very bottom. Uh, Canada sold all of their gold. And so uh, what's happening, though, is it's flowing from west where, you know, England and Canada are selling their gold. And who's the buyer? Russia and China. Those are the big buyers. So this is uh, very good work here, putting this in some charts. And then another nail in the coffin. Saudis threatened to ditch the petrodollar as a nuclear option to block the NOPEC bill. Uh, NOPEC is a bill that would allow companies to sue Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabian countries under antitrust laws. They'd be suing them for manipulating the price of oil and uh, making it harder to compete. Also, they mention in here the U.S. dollar's exorbitant privilege, which is a term that Charles de Gaulle used in a speech. He was president of France. He used that in a speech where he was uh, wanting to go back to the gold standard and end the Bretton Woods system. And he with, they withdrew from the uh, London gold pool, which was manipulating the price of gold and suppressing it, uh, keeping it close to the uh, Bretton Woods price of $35 an ounce. And countries would pool their gold and they would sell it every time the price rose to smash the price down uh, to try and keep the Bretton Woods system going. But uh, he didn't like the idea that the U.S. could just print as many dollars as they want. And then we said that they'd be backed by gold, but uh, uh, we kept on printing more dollars. And so France started cashing in their dollars. Other countries jumped on board and... Uh, the U.S. had to take us off of the Bretton Woods system. And, you know, it's, it amazes me that the international, the global uh, dollar standard has held together this long. Because when Nixon took uh, the world off of uh, gold in 1971 and all the currencies became floating fiat currencies, um, that was the first time that this had been tried on a global basis. Uh, before that, every time a country had ended backing their currency with something tangible, the currency fell apart. It either went into hyperinflation or people gravitated toward other currencies. It, it, uh, they all died before that. And so what you're seeing right now in Venezuela is the result of fiat currencies. It's an unbacked currency, and they're in the midst of a hyperinflation. It fails every time. What's amazing is the last great precious metals bull market in the 70s. Uh, that culminated with a panic that was going on in the uh, very in late 79 and early 1980. From November of 79 to January of 1980, it wasn't just a bull market. Gold was absolutely soaring, and it was soaring because the U.S. dollar had only been a fiat currency for a few years. And, you know, it was, it was uh, eight years that it had been a fiat currency, 
And some people thought that the current that the U.S. dollar was going to go the way of all the other fiat currencies that had existed before it, and go to zero, and they were uh, just stampeding toward gold. Well, you know we've got a situation now. Uh, the the global dollar standard was stable for many years, even though it got through that period of uh, people panicking into gold back in late '79, early 1980. Um, there was a period of stability until Saddam Hussein started selling oil for euros. Uh, that was the first nail in the coffin that I can identify. I used to keep a list of all of the nails in the coffin, but it's there's so many now, I can't keep up with it. And so with the next crisis, we're going to see something really big happen. And like I said, it just absolutely amazes me that uh, we've been like fooled or tricked into uh, accepting all of this credit currency that impoverishes Main Street and, and enriches Wall Street. It's a false monetary system that really needs uh, reforming. Uh, but, you know, this, this is the way things are right now. And the further things, the, the longer that things go, uh, the worse that the... Uh, reversion back to the mean is going to be the, the correction. Uh, and it is possible that this time uh, we could f see a serious problem with the currency, and I believe there will be one. And to close, I want to show you uh, just a couple of lines in this great ar article by John Hussman of Hussman Funds. And it's very worth reading, but he's a very, very technical writer. Anyway, down in the middle of his article, there's uh, this line here that says, I remember a little boy listening to a concert at a 4th of July celebration one year. As the music played, the little boy waved his arms in the air as if he was conducting the orchestra. Monetary authorities are a lot like that, except that everyone who watches these kids at play actually believes that they are, in fact, conducting the orchestra. Come on now. Give the U.S. economy, its millions of workers, and its entrepreneurial spirit some credit. And then later on in the uh, article, uh, and, you know, it's a very good article to read. Uh, I, I would suggest reading it. But um, this is a very good quote here. Again, it's possible that the systematic component of Fed policy, the part that represents a predictable, stable, calculable response to output in unemployment and inflation may actually be useful. It's the activist, unsystematic, crackpot, deranged, Bernanke yelling clown carnival stuff that's utterly useless and predictably destructive over the complete course of the bubble crash cycle. Now, in this article, he sort of di dissects the bubble crash cycle, but without these guys, there would be no bubble crash cycle. The bubble is only created by the Federal Reserve and our false monetary system that transfers wealth from Main Street to Wall Street. Thank you very much for listening. If you got anything from this, please like it, share it, click that little bell uh, to uh, sign up for alerts, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.